Oh yeah, what we're going to be looking at today, our topic is dragging the king out and attacking the king in the center. It's kind of two different topics, which we've combined into one lesson. So I'm going to try to split the time 50-50, which we spend on each one. Here's just a quote by Alexander Korov on dragging out the king. He puts it in a nice, colorful way. He says, the attacking pieces do not always succeed in trapping the opponent's king behind its wall of pawns. The king feels safe and secure. But there is one tactical method. The king is pitilessly dragged out from its hiding place by a sacrifice and driven in front of its wall of pawns. Not infrequently being chased right into the center, the usual end of such a stroll is the mate of the king, which is hunted down. Okay, I think he nicely explains the idea behind that one. And then probably in the second half of the lesson, we're going to be looking at attacking the king in the center. This is before the king gets a chance to castle. In the opening, one of the most important tasks for a player, along with the quick development and the struggle for the center, is to secure the positioning of his king. Anyone who goes against this principle, either by choice or because he is forced to do so, will have to expect an energetic attack to be mounted against his insufficiently well-protected king. Players are often ready to make material sacrifices, usually one or two pawns, but sometimes even a minor piece, in order to prevent castling and keep the opposing king in the center. This was written by Arta Yusupov. I'm not that fluent with my words. We're going to look at some games by Edward Lasker. We're going to look at Kasparov's Immortal Game. If you haven't seen that, that's a real treat. Then a couple more games that will also be interesting. Um, let me just check that I do disable the waiting room here so that people can join and I don't need to let everyone in. Pull up the chat over here as well. Okay, let's get things going. So this first game, I think a few of you would have seen it, especially the higher rated players amongst you. It's a game by Edward Lasker against George Allen Thomas. Very famous game. It starts with d4 and then e6. In fact, I'm not actually sure how it starts, which is kind of funny, because I looked at this game. I, chess base had the start of it one way, and this book I found it in had it another way. Chess base recorded like this, d4, e6, knight f3, f5, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, e4, f takes e4, and knight takes e4. Whereas the book I found it in had it written a different way, starting with black playing f5. And then we got this interesting line off the e4, f takes e4, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, e6, knight takes e4, bishop e7, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, knight f3. And we reached the same position anyway. So I'm not actually sure which one is actually how the game happened i would say it's more likely it's this variation it looks a bit more believable but let's go back to the what happened bishop takes f6 takes knight takes black decided to play b6 he wants to play bishop b7 where he can develop the bishop to control this nice diagonal take advantage of all those light squares white now played knight e5 which okay we know from our basic chess opening principles that moving the same piece multiple times in the center isn't always a good idea. You're better off developing your other pieces, getting your king safe, stuff like that. Unfortunately, don't know how to remove these lead chess annotations. So you'll have to see these big yellow question marks when mistakes are made. Black castles, white continues developing of bishop d3 and black plays bishop d7. He is again continuing on with his plan. He wants to take advantage of his diagonal. If white plays slowly now, maybe black gets some nice counterplay going. White, however, does not hesitate. He goes queen h5. He's going in for the attack. Do any of you remember seeing this game before? How many people we got here? We do have a few people. Any uh, of you seen this? I game? remember this game. I've seen this game. Yeah. I exactly how it ends. Yeah, you'll know it when you see it. Anyone else besides Ron seen this? You can unmute yourself or just type an answer in the chat. Otherwise, I'll assume no one else has seen it because it is a real treat. Okay, black continues with queen e7, which you will see recorded as a mistake. Now we need to work out why is queen e7 a mistake. Somebody besides Rowan find an answer for us. Don't 
because it's not immediately clear. The plan was behind queen e7 is obviously to meet knight takes f6 with g takes f6, and then have the queen protect h7. So, and that position would probably be quite good for black because white's knight would get chased away from e5 and you would need to find a, a new home for it. Any ideas? Given the topic of the lecture, I thought everyone would be screaming this. Queen takes h7. Straight up sacrificing the queen. And okay, this does need to be calculated quite a bit. Let me turn off these engines. I don't know why that was on. If king takes h7, which, okay, is the only move. The, his idea, which last guard calculated, knight takes f6. Double check. Twice as good as a singular check. And okay, we all know with double check, it means the king has to move. There is no way to block. So the king is forced up the board to h6. If he goes to h8, knight g6 is going to be a very unpleasant end for him. So he comes up with h6. Now again, white needs to find an accurate move. If I'm correct, Joe, there's only this is the only winning move for white. There's no other move that can continue the attack. So he plays knight e to g4. Again, forcing the king up. The king is cut off his retreat, so he's forced to go to g5. He's being lured forward. If you remember our introduction, we talked about how the king is often chased all the way up the board into the center where he'll often meet his demise. White plays h4, again chasing the king. King doesn't have very many options, so he comes to f4. g3, chasing the king again. King to f3. Now he keeps chasing the king. He doesn't suddenly start the playing slowly. He's already sacrificed his queen. He plays bishop e2. The king is forced to g2. Suddenly, black's king is where we would almost expect white's king to be. And after rook h2, king g1. I think we maybe see the nicest move of the game. Because I get well, the logical move for white to play is something like long castles and checkmates. How, how cool is that? Checkmating with castling. But white just shows his class and just moves his king instead. He doesn't want to waste time moving both the pieces with his hand. He just plays king d2 and his mate of the discovered attack of the rook. So this game, I th think, is made to look easy by Lasker's calculation abilities. Because he would have had to have seen all of this from maybe even when he played queen h5. Or at the very least, when he played queen takes h7. But already, yeah, I think you would have had to have seen some degree of it. And it's not that easy. Because I might calculate to a position like this, and then I'm not sure. Because it's difficult to visualize. But he calculates accurately, he calculates thoroughly, and he has a forcing variation. So there's no reason not to play it. And then this nice finish with king to d2. But any questions about this game, or shall we keep things moving? It was a nice short game to get us started. Okay, let's move on to the next game. Another game I think that you people should have seen if you have a sophisticated chess education. This is Gary Kasparov against Vasilin Topolov. Two very, I think, strong players, especially in their prime. They are both known for playing aggressive fighting chess. Kasparov is arguably the greatest chess player to ever live. So it's always going to be a treat. And if you hear it's Kasparov's best game, you know it's going to be very good. The game starts with e4. There is some annotations on the side, Joe. I think this is from chess base. I might have stole it from chess.com or something as well. And black plays d6. So black is already pulling out the perk defense, which I know some people Joya, do play it. Mr. Daryl, I know, plays the perk defense and maybe one or two other people, it can get very feisty and there can be a lot of blood going around. D4 is played, white plays principally. If your opponent offers you the center, you take it. Black developed with knight f6, we get knight to c3, g6, planning to fianchetto the dark square bishops, bishop e3, bishop to g7, queen d2. Kasparov is playing extremely principally. He's just developing his pieces, controlling the center, 
He's maybe going to castle long. He might just play something like knight f3, bishop e2, and castle short. Maybe he'll play f4. He's keeping it flexible and just playing solid chess. c6 is played by black. A very common idea in all these perk defenses. You play c6, you start this pawn storm and get some expansion. And ideally, you're going to kick this knight away and maybe open up your, I think, dragon bishop, if we can call it that. And that dark squid bishop can get really powerful if white lets it get out of control. White continues with pawn to f3, solidifying the center even more. b5, black sticks with his plan. Topple of wants to expand on the queen side. Now this creates the idea of the bishop coming to b7, and as I mentioned, kicking the knight away. Knight e2, Kasparov's developing. He's playing principal chess. He's not wasting any time. There's no funny pawn moves. He's just bringing out all these pieces. If now black does decide to go ahead and kick the knight, the knight is quite comfortable on a4, even though it might not be the most appealing thing to put the knight on the edge of the board, it is still very well placed and quite safe from attack. In the game though, Topolov does not go for that. He rather develops his own pieces, knight b to d7. And now white decides he wants to try and mess with his opponent's plan. Bishop h6, trading the dark squared bishops. As I mentioned earlier, this Fianchetto bishop or dragon's bishop can get very strong. So Kasparov wastes no time in trading at all. So now either black is forced to castle or he's forced to play bishop takes h6 like he does in the game. If he chooses to castle, he could get in a lot of trouble after something like h4, yeah. There's always this idea of just playing h5. And if knight takes h5, you play rook takes h5, sacrifice the exchange, and it can get very scary for black. As well as, okay, you don't need to be that aggressive, you can just go h4 and g4 as well. But there's an already made attack for white. So Topolov being a, quite an aggressive player, he doesn't want to do that. He rather plays bishop takes h6, queen takes h6. Now we see black cannot castle short. There's no way he's castling short, so either he's keeping the king in the center, or he's going to castle queenside. On the other hand, white does have the small disadvantage that this queen on h6 could be misplaced. We can envision a position similar to what happened in the game, where if black castles queenside, suddenly the queen's a bit silly all the way on h6, doing nothing. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Bishop b7 is played by black. Bishop develops and adds important control to the d5 square. Black does not want to allow white to take even more space in the center. In fact, maybe black wants to even break in the center of c5 or e5. Lots of potential. The pawn structure is dynamic. White plays a3, a nice prophylactic move. Black has had many chances to push b4 and chase the knight away, but now he's out of chances. He no longer has that option available to him. Black pushes e5. Black takes control of the center. Topolov again, he's trying to play as aggressively as he can. He doesn't want to sit around scared and let Kasparov bully him. He wants to play his game. And that's often a very good approach, especially if you play higher rated players. If you just sit there passively, they're going to find a way to beat you because they're good players. Whereas maybe it's better to make the game a bit more complicated and maybe you can confuse them. White now castles queenside. Getting this rook nicely on the file, opposite the black queen potentially in some variations. The queen steps out of the way, coming to e7. King comes to b1. Very nice move as well. A lot of times you'll see players, okay, I'm guilty of this as well. When they cast a queen side, they don't play a move like king b1, and they get their king in trouble on this diagonal. So there's, I think, Ben Feingold, I mention him a lot, he's in a American Grandmaster has a lot of lectures online and quite a big personality. He always preaches if you castle queenside, take the time to play king b1. You just step out of so many tactical ideas and it's just a lot safer for your king in general. As is noted in the annotation here, Kasparov is patient and places his king on the safer b1 square. And then the other idea is to bring this knight to c1 and potentially to b3 or d3, just giving himself a bit more options. Currently, these knights are what I think Dvoretsky calls superfluous. They're kind of stepping on each other's toes, right? It wouldn't really matter if there was one knight or two knights. 
because they're doing the same job. So this nice little rerouting idea of C1 gives these pieces more space and more potential. Black plays A6. He's solidifying the B5 pawn. The point of A6 is he wants to maybe play C5, expand even more. Knight C1 is played. Black long castles. We see castling happening on the same side. The same side also where black is expanding his pawns. So black has to be careful that his king doesn't get weak from these pawns being too far expanded. Knight b3 is played. White starts sticking with his plan. E takes d4. White chooses to play rook takes d4 and c5. Black is not sitting by. He's counterattacking in the center, especially while this queen is somewhat out of the game. He forces the rook to come back and then he just plays knight b6. Now this idea of d5 is coming. And if white isn't careful, black is going to be doing quite well. So white needs to find some active plan. He plays g3, creating the potential of either bishop h3 or maybe just bishop g2, depending on if he wants to solidify the center a bit more. Black goes king b8, trying to get his king a bit safer. Now knight a5. Okay, I see Leeches has decided this is a terrible move, but... Okay, I think unless there's some concrete reason, it's very principally correct. The reason he plays knight a5 is he wants to attack this bishop. This bishop is one of black's better pieces, and it's probably the main defender of his king. And this is kind of where Kasparov starts his whole master plan. The simple idea of attacking the bishop. Okay, the bishop could stay here. Yeah, there is some variations. I think, what was the option for black here? Yeah. He could even play d5, I think, in some lines. But bishop a8 is played, which, okay, he seeks to preserve the bishop and secure the light squares. You'll often see these ideas, especially if the fianchetted bishops were, if, let's say, white gets a battery of his bishop and queen here and tries to trade bishops, this bishop dodging that exchange, purely because the bishop by the king is so valuable, because it protects all the light squares. Bishop h3, Again, ignore these things, annotating stuff as mistakes. I don't really know what they're talking about. This, it's probably not even a mistake. There's just a, maybe a more concrete tactical line that works. Principally, that's correct. And I believe white is still winning after this move. I think here the, is there an annotation? Yeah, they want queen f4. They want the queen to come back into the game because the queen's a bit stuck on h6. And then maybe this light squid bishop is a bit flexible. D5 though. Black takes his chance to break. He wants to open up the center and then use his queen side space to maybe start squeezing white. White now chooses to play queen f4, bringing the queen back into the game. King to a7. And now I want you guys to think for a little bit. It is white's move. We do need to find somewhat of a plan. If we are not careful, black is going to play d5. He's going to play rook h to e8. And he's just going to have very good development and coordination of these pieces. So already, yeah, I think this is where Kasparov shows his ability to almost predict the future and how the game is continue. I'm going to give you guys is a little bit annoying of annoying if I say I've seen this game as well? No, you should have seen this game. You should have. It's, it's a very famous game. It's, it's the best Kasparov game there is. Like, Kasparov played a lot of nice games, but this is the game. But yeah, I do apologize that I am using such standard games. There's no, some more. Just, then, I, then I just won't immediately say the move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. I think the other two games we're going to look at a bit later, I don't think you would have seen. These two are very well. But okay, anyone else have some ideas? Even just normal moves. I'm not necessarily saying that this is some brilliant sacrifice. Just how are you going to deal with the threat of d4? And how can you improve your position as white? Because we've kind of maximized all of our pieces. This knight on a5, okay, there's no way to improve him. He's half stuck here. This knight on c3, he doesn't really have much of a future. His job is contesting d5, and d5 just happened. Our queen is probably optimally placed on f4, a bishop on h3. And okay, our rook here can probably come into the game, but if we bring our rook into the game, we have to consider the consequences of black pushing d4. That being said, Kasparov decides to just calmly move his rook. He is not afraid of d4. He plays rook h to e1. And 
if you play this move, you have to know how you're going to react to d4. This has to be calculated ahead of time. And it's not immediately clear, because if you play d4 here with black, which is what Topolov chose to do, suddenly it's awkward for our knight. We don't really want to go back to any of these squares, because we're just going to be almost blocking our own pieces. We could envision this knight getting trapped. But Kasparov has no fear. He jumps in of knight d5. Okay, it feels like there's a lot more black pieces attacking that than there are white pieces defending it. So Topolov simply captures. After e takes d5, we see the reason that rook h e1 was played. Okay, the queen is hit, so the queen has to move. Queen comes to d6. There is no problems for black. Unless Kasparov finds another brilliant move, which is not so natural. He plays rook takes d4. Somebody tell me what happens after f takes d4. Or c takes d4. I'm not so good at the alphabet. Somebody give me a variation. Otherwise, I'll ask Mr. Rowan to recite his knowledge. You're welcome to type it in chat or just unmute yourself. Um, queen, after pawn takes d4, then queen takes d4 check. Okay, queen takes d4 check. And if I just block with the queen? Then uh, rook check, drop down the rook. You want to drop down the rook. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how I want to block this now. Can I not go knight d7? Mm. You have sacrificed a rook, so I'm trying to keep a bit of material. But I am willing to give some back. Okay, uh, rook takes um, knight check. Rook takes knight. I'll take you back. Then um, what about queen takes rook down there? Queen takes rook. And it's... I don't know. Check first. Check first. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's fine like that. No, okay. Take your time. Queen takes a8. Now I presume your idea is if I take your knight, you take my rook. At the end of the day, you have two extra pawns. So that looks pretty nice. Um... Hmm. Can I not just play rook takes pawn though? And I'm up an exchange. You do have an extra pawn, but this knight is kind of stuck. Right? So though this is maybe playable for you, I don't think you're winning. Which, okay, this is a complicated position, so there is nothing wrong with not having the perfect variation. But we do need something slightly more clean. But c takes d4. How do we punish this as white? We are down a rook. Any other ideas? Doesn't seem like it. Rowan, you remember the move? No pressure. Um, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, I do. <laughs> I think the move is um, Rook E seven check. Oh, Waylon has some chess education. Rookie seven check. Yeah, thinking off, about um, rookie seven. If I take this, thanks for the rook. Queen takes D. Queen oh, takes, check. and then off the king B eight. Queen B6 check. Queen B6, and this is mate. There's too much happening here. I actually have this in a book. I get this quickly. This is Fighting Chess by Kasparov. The first chess book I actually tried to read. I think I was like a very weak chess player who just knew what forks and pins were. Then I asked my parents for a chess book, and I got this massive theoretical book. If you look, read that book, Kasparov has this game annotated. And there's literally like six or seven pages of his variations, which he claims to have seen during the game, but I full on don't believe him and believe he just like, I don't know, sat there analyzing it for two weeks, being proud of himself and found variations that make him look smart. But this variation does work. 
and this is what was definitely calculated in the game. And arguably, I think you have to see this rookie seven from, yeah. If you're playing this in a game and you play rook ht1, you have to see rook e7. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Otherwise, your knight gets attacked. If you move it back, you're too passive. If you move forward and you don't see rook e7, then like, what are you doing here? You're trading queens and losing. So he has to see this rook takes d4, and then he has to see this rook e7, which is a brilliant combination, which he managed to spot in the game. King to b6 is played. There is some other variations. I don't want to get too deep into this, but if you're serious about improving your chess, have a look at this game. The book I mentioned, Fighting Chess, has Kasparov's analysis of it, and it's really deep and will benefit everyone quite a lot. Now white needs to find a way to continue the attack, though, with queen takes d4. He is sacking a knight now. The knight is hanging. And black doesn't really have a choice. He has to take it almost. I think if just queen c5, feels like this should be a, within the knight's hanging, right? Yeah. The knight hangs on f6, and that'll be basically game over. So he's forced to be greedy. He's forced to capture the knight. Black doesn't have a choice. Now b4. We can already see that there's mating that's happening here. The king has forced up the board. If we can teleport our queen to g3, that's mate. If we can teleport our queen to h, a6, that's also mate. I'm saying the wrong letters. a6 and b3 would be mate. If we can even put our bishop on b3, that would be very close to mate. If we can get our rook to a, a6, that's close to mate. There's a lot of ideas here. I'm slightly curious how much of this Kasparov saw. I think he might have seen like up to around here when he played rook hd1, but that's just me speculating. Very nice move now. Queen c3. Quiet move. He's not looking for anything too exciting. He just wants to play queen b3 checkmate. That's all he wants in life. Which, okay, he's also combining the idea of queen b3 with something like rook h7 can also be a big problem. So black needs to find a way to defend this. As you can see in this leecher study, I have a ton of variations here. I copied, I think this from a chess.com blog I was going through, but I will make this link available if you guys are interested in going through it in more depth. Queen takes d5 though from black, and now he's defending against this g3 mate. And off the rook a7, he feels the need to play bishop b7. And this full-on sacrifices the bishop because off the rook takes b7, we cannot take it back because we'll get mated. So black sees that he's up, I think, a rook and a piece at this stage. Yeah, it is a rook and a piece, and he's willing to give it back. So he gives back one of the pieces. Now he's up a rook. Now, if he checks on d1, which looks very tempting at first, the king just does not go to g2. Because if you go king g2, you run into queen d4, trading the queens. I think you just play king to a2 and everything is fine. This idea, this idea is just a bit too strong. And the knight is also hanging, potentially. So in the game, queen c4 is played. Black wants to trade queens. Even though black just gave up a bishop, he is still up one rook, one full rook at that. White says, no, thank you, and plays queen takes f6. He picks up another knight and he threatens mate again. There is no rest for the black king. Black king is also forced to run even further up the board. King takes a3. The king is almost trying to launch a checkmating attack on the white king. If we were looking at a Nigel short game that I've showed most of you before, I think it's they call it a short king walk or something. Very nice game where he just walks his king up the board in a middle game to checkmate. If I was playing white, I'd probably get myself checkmated here, and suddenly this would be Topolov's immortal game, but this is Kasparov playing white. Queen takes a6. This is obviously calculated. If the king takes b4, we're once again running out of steam. How can we continue the attack with white? I'll give you guys a little bit of time to think about it. Again, you are welcome to just unmute yourself or type some answers in the chat. What about rook sacrifice? Check. Benjamin wants to play rook takes b5. That's correct. 
Okay, if I just play queen takes. Mm. Was F3. It like, yeah, I'm thinking that might have been Benjamin's idea to play C3. Yeah, which... C3. Yeah. Oh, that's so bad with numbers. If I take it, okay, you're hanging... The, I'm hanging my queen. If I and go if king C4, C4, I think this yeah, is one. But I think the problem yeah. is I have another move, and I say check. Yes. And which also yeah. means I can play king C4, right? <laughs> so, mm. so that is... Unfortunately, not working. Okay. Okay. Nice idea, though. Any other ideas? Kasparov praised this move in his annotations of it. I don't actually think this move is that good, because I feel like you come to it by the process of elimination. It's not the first move you think of, but eventually you have to try and make it work. What is White's one forcing move that makes any sense? Because we looked at Rook takes B5, that doesn't work. Is there any other forcing moves that are tempting? Bishop F1. If Bishop F1, he can take that and say check. He takes it with check, yeah. Yeah. Um, was it? Why rather, was it why rather, why rather not uh, Rook takes F7? Rook takes f7, no. I mean, what's your idea if I just play queen takes f7? And mm -hmm. even if I don't play queen takes f7, I feel like it's a little slow, right? We're down a rook. We don't care too much about pawns. Bishop e6. Bishop e6. Wow, where are these moves coming from? Um, What's the plan if I take this? <laughs> I, I I don't know. It looks like a free bishop to me. I'm surprised this hasn't been suggested yet. C3. Like, it's... I mean, it's not immediately clear what happens after king takes C3, right? We understand queen takes C3 can't be played. So, but it still needs to be calculated. Which, okay, after king takes C3, I think the move that maybe wasn't spotted by us is this queen A1 check. And white can continue harassing this black king, which it's a nice bit of geometry. And there is going to be potential for this rook to be hanging in the future if this black rook ever leaves the back rank. This is what was played. The king came to d2. Queen b2, check. King comes to d1. And now bishop f1. That's a nice move, eh? Very nice move. What happens after queen takes f1? Who can see checkmate patterns? So this is the advanced isn't class. It, we should see mate. Isn't it just checkmate. simply queen d2, king e1, yeah. rook to e7? No, rook e7, that's just mate. Very nice pattern. So rather than doing that, black goes and plays rook to d2. Very dynamic counter-attacking move but now a very nice move which i think is why this game became kasparov's immortal is because of how he keeps finding nice moves rook d7 pinning the rook to the king he still has this idea of queen takes a8 he still has this idea of taking the queen black is forced now to just play rook takes d7 and they liquidate pieces and even this position isn't completely over just yet. There, there's ideas with this coming, with this coming. I'd be kind of scared playing this. I think if we give Black one more move, I think he draws. If I do this, does he draw? No, he doesn't. Wait, how do I put this on threats? I don't know. Wait, if I do this. Which I go after. He played Rook D3 in the game, but I think the... There's an interesting variation where he gets to push this pawn and check, and then the pawn just starts running while the king is trapped on a1, which, okay, that's another line Kasparov goes into quite a bit. In the game, though, rook d3, Kasparov showed some nice technique with queen a8, and then he just brought the queen back to a4, and, okay, the moment that the black king is chased away from the pawn, there's no longer any danger. And the game concluded over here. So a very nice game by Kasparov. I mean, this black king got chased 
it was forced into long casting, which it didn't want. And then it ended up this whole walk up the board all the way here yeah, somehow, something like that. Which, okay, this, I don't know how far Kasparov calculated, but he definitely calculated a decent amount of it. And he kept finding good attacking moves. He never took his foot off the throat. I get a lot of games, I feel like, where I have a really strong attack, and then I play one or two passive moves and my opponent's fine. Kasparov always had that killer instinct, so he found the way to do this. Very nice game, though. I'd recommend you guys check it out a bit more in depth than I have showed it here. Any questions? No questions. Then we can move on. We're going to do a few more exercises. I think we'll maybe do like maybe a couple. We'll see how long it takes us to get through these. Some of them are easier than others. And then we'll move on to our other games and look at attacking the king in the center. Let me just hide the answers here because I know you good people would never cheat, but I will do it anyway. This is white to play. We are looking for combinations. What I want you people to do is calculate the whole variation. I don't want you to just sacrifice random pieces and then say it looks like something's happening. I want you to calculate to a, a point and then you need to say of confidence that the valuation of that position. My first chess coach, he always said, when you solve puzzles, you need to be willing to bet 10 Rand that your answer is right. So what I'm going to do, I think let's put a clock on for two minutes. I'll put a time on for two minutes. I won't take any answers before then. And then after two minutes, we'll have a look at some answers. Okay. Okay, I think two minutes is up now. Does anyone have a variation or answer they'd like to share? Uh, knight f6 check. That's right. Knight f6 check. Okay. Um, I think the logical... Okay, I have to play king of seven or king of eight now, right? That's yes. King of eight. Then queen h7. Queen h7 and this is... This is one of the answers. This 100% does work. I think if I, I think this is mate in two or mate in three, it's very close. There, there's no way basically for you to stop queen g8. There's also the rook coming in. So this way does work. Very nicely calculated. The more flashy way though, queen h7 also exists, which again, this is definitely the more prettier way to finish it. I don't know if anyone saw this variation or did most of you see knight f6? Anyone see this line? I literally like saw queen to h7, but then I was like, I don't see the follow up, so no. Yeah, okay, no, fair enough. It does need to be calculated. If the king takes h7, I think the follow up that you're missing is very hard to see. Rook takes g7. The, the knight of six line that the coach was said is a lot more natural. 
Because like it feels like we're giving up a bit too much now with the queen and the rook. But after rook takes g7, knight f6, after king g6, there's this very aesthetic mate with bishop h5. This is actually from a game. Let me see if I can find it, which game it is from. Um, it's from a game of Ali Ekin against some random person called West. Quite an interesting game. Ali Ekin always had a flair for the exuberant. But okay, the knight f6 variation does work as well. Let's go on to another one. I do know we are, I'm not giving you guys too much time. I am only giving you two minutes. So it is often quite hard to see the whole variation. But it's just to get your brain working and not listening to me the whole time. There is going to be quite a few exercises that we don't get to tonight that you'll be able to solve in your free time as well. Okay, this is white to play again. I'm going to give you guys two minutes and then we'll discuss the position. Okay, that is two minutes. Anyone have some ideas? This one is quite a bit more challenging than the previous one, I would say. You don't necessarily need to have the right answer, just even if it's just some variation you calculated that um, doesn't work. Well, I calculated a rook takes f6. Okay. Uh, what variation did you calculate after rook takes f6? A bishop takes f6, queen mm -hmm. to... Oh, wait, this isn't... This is c, my bad, c6. Then queen c4, check. Mm -hmm. King g2, and then I was trying to see how to make knight d4, d, uh, e5 work. I'm e5. not seeing it. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's quite worked because the bishop's obviously hanging. Yeah. Okay, that is an interesting line. We'll maybe look at that a bit more. Anyone else have some ideas? Okay. Because it's a difficult position in the start because it doesn't feel like we have a way to lure the king out and get our king hunt going. Like a lot of these puzzles, you know, you know when you see it, you see it. And you instantly think, oh, let's sacrifice random pieces to get the king out and hope we stumble across a checkmate. This problem, the only capture we have is rook takes c6, which is what was played. So Rowan's instincts are serving him well. The bishop takes c6, queen c4, this is all right. And here is where the excitement starts. And this is a very difficult thing to calculate. I remember I solved this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Is it something like bishop f1? Bishop f1. Um... I don't think bishop f1's ever mate, though. Because if you play bishop f1, let's say I do nothing. I'm a nice guy. Well, now you just check. I go king g8 and pretend everything's fine. Which I think it is fine. 
but yeah, this, as I said, like we're going through these problems quite quickly, so not seeing all of it is forgiven. The idea here is the sacrifice. And I feel like if you're the guy playing black in this position and that move hits the board, you sit up a little bit more. You you kind of realize something's <laughs> going on. This game was from, I think, is it Jack Kasparian against Manuelian? I don't think everyone's familiar with these players. Kasparian's the main one you should know. He composes a lot of studies. Like, the guy composes some of the most beautiful positions in chess. So I think it's kind of fitting that he finds this very beautiful queen sacrifice. The idea is obviously off the king takes c6 is forced. A move like knight e5 yeah, is natural. G5, it looks checkmate, yeah. It's not checkmate though. Oh no, no, he's got yeah, there's he's got a lot G5. more to it. And I found this like quite quickly when I was first solving this puzzle, like in the first five minutes or something. But then I calculate king c5. Then what? We have a knight and a bishop. <clears throat> and it's quite hard to checkmate of just a knight and a bishop. So it continues knight d3, which, okay, the king can still come up the board and there's plenty of space. And then we get the move that's of cloth, king d2. A quiet moves, c3 is mate next move, and there's nothing black can do about it. Which, okay, this is a beautiful solution. Currently, white is down. I'm bad at maths. How many points is white down? I think white's down nine points. Nine points sounds about right. And he plays a move that's not a check. And there's no way that the queen or the rook can get in the game quick enough to prevent the c3 idea. So that is a very nice variation. If there's no questions or comments, we'll move on to the next one. I think we'll maybe look, do one more of these exercises and then get into the other games. I like hearing my sweet voice. It's not as much fun watching you people suffer as it used to be. Okay, this one is very interesting one as well this is white to play same procedure as last time i'm going to give you guys a couple minutes again i don't expect you to necessarily calculate all the variations just try and see the ideas try and see what you think is promising and then we'll talk about it in two minutes Okay, that is two minutes up. Anyone have some ideas or variations they've calculated that they'd like to share? Yeah, this one's also quite tricky. Because when I was preparing for this lesson, I was reading a bunch of articles and some stuff in magazines that I found. And this problem showed up. And I had 
I remembered seeing it, but I sat there for 10 minutes trying to calculate the variations because I just couldn't remember it. And it's a terrible feeling when you've seen well, something. Yeah, Rowan? Well, in my opinion, like, White has to do something because he's losing that night. Yeah, there um, is this pin happening. On and the only thing I could really see was Knight takes C6. Okay. Um, Knight takes C6. And then... We're hitting the queen uh, and we're hitting the rook. Yeah, but funny enough, rook just just rook takes d4 is fine. Mm, rook takes d4. Uh, are you meaning rook? I, I think. Um, yeah, they rook. Takes, yeah, I think rook. rook okay, rook takes e4. Yeah, and then you. Yeah, e4. Okay, sorry, my bad. Knight takes d8, and then rook takes c5, and we get a position like I don't know how I recapture this. Probably if the no, I don't want. I don't want to no, take do the not, rook. Not with the rook. That, that's the, the one. Rook. Probably with the pawn, then. Yeah, this one. I want. Or it could be that. I, I don't know. Feel like that. black's better or not worse. Hmm. It's an interesting position. We can agree on that, but I don't think it's conclusively better for white. No. Like, no, okay. not at all. And, and you that's come. The only yeah. thing. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it, as you said, like you kind of have to come to a knight move almost, which, okay, knight takes c6 is one variation, which, okay, upon calculation, we realize doesn't work. The alternative that also attacks the queen is knight f7, which is the right answer, which, okay, we now need to calculate two main moves. We need to calculate rook takes e4, and we need to calculate king takes f7. If king takes f7, we have this nice idea of queen h5. Which, okay, now if the king moves back, we just capture here. If g6 is played, we can capture on h7. So he's forced to go king e7. And then there's this mating sequence after rook takes e6. King takes and rook e1. And okay, this is quite long, but already yeah, you can start to feel like there's a checkmate, which I think you would calculate in a game. It's just this pattern, and that's quite quick and decisive. So he cannot actually take the knight. And this is where I was stumbling a lot because queen e8 is very natural. And now it's not immediately clear what we're doing and wh why is our knight sitting there? Because it's not doing much on f7. It's almost just a target and we're getting it trapped behind enemy lines. However, we have this nice idea of rook e6, queen e6. And then knight d8, and as in Grandmaster Chess, we go and pick up this pawn, and it's a lot better for white. And, okay, in the variation we looked at of knight takes c6, I think that might just be an equal ending, so that's probably the second best move. But, yeah, we get a pawn up. We have better pieces. We should be able to grind out a win, especially of this knight of blacks being so terrible on c8. But, uh, that's Second enough. best move is not good enough. Yeah. When you see a good move, look for a better one. I never know who said that, because uh, everyone says it these days. So. But yeah, okay, I'm not going to go through the rest of these exercises because I think it's more fun looking at some games. You are most welcome, obviously, to go through these exercises in your own time. I think I've put in the answers for like four to six. Maybe I'll post the answers on the WhatsApp group later, along with the Leecher study link, because these, I think, are really helpful, because this whole topic... You can see the ideas, but you need to know how to calculate, right? Like, if we play Kasparov's games and we play the same sacrifice as he does, but we don't see the whole variation, we're just going to mess it up. So I think it's really important to get some calculation practice. So I would recommend working through these. But hey, let's move on to some other games. This is kind of transitioning to our second topic for the evening, which is attacking the king in the center. We've looked at some examples where we're luring the king out and getting mating nets and ideas like that. Now we're going to look at, I'd say, more an example that's going to come up more in your own games, where your opponent maybe thinks he can get away with not castling or he's delaying it a bit too long. I know a lot of my private students and that they often think castling's overrated and they know better, but it will usually come and bite you in the end. So this game we're going to look at, it's between Jan Timan and Efim Gela. People, I don't think everyone's familiar with. Jan Timan, I think most chess players should have heard of. He was the top Dutch player for a very long time. And I think probably the greatest Dutch chess player until Anish Giri came along. Let me flip the board because unfortunately Jan Timan isn't having the greatest time here. 
So we look at a lot of games where Jan Timmer doesn't have lots of fun. I think that game where Nigel Short walked up his king was against Jan Timmer. First game starts d4, d5. We get c4, and e6, a queen's gambit. Every world champion ever has played the queen's gambit at some point. It's a very theoretical and topical opening that I think most chess players should play at some point. Knight c3, bishop e7. Bishop e7 is a nice move. I play bishop e7 myself. Anyone's interested in secretly prepping against me, you know what to target. The whole idea of bishop e7 is you don't want to play knight f6 and have some variation where we pin this knight, we go f3 and e4 and white plays like Kasparov and checks mates us. So if bishop e7, we either force the knight to come to f3, where it's going to stop this idea of moving the f1, or we force him to put the bishop on f4 where it's not as actively placed. White goes for knight f3, knight f6, and now we've dodged all these variations where white goes f3 and e4 and checkmates us. Black castles, this is all mainline stuff. e3, h6, bishop h4. Black now goes b6. He can also play knight e4. This is the Lasker defense. We looked at one of Lasker's games earlier. This is his most notable contribution to opening theory, which, okay, the whole idea is you get this dynamic position of black where you have some attack. It's not immediately clear who's better. You're going to fianchetto this bishop on b7, and it's an interesting game. But b6 is the more suppressed move, the move I also choose to play. Whenever in these queen's gambit structures your opponent plays b6, you often want to exchange on d5 nice and quickly because you're going to then block this bishop when it comes to b7. Knight takes d5, bishop e7, queen e7, knight d5. E takes d5. A lot of exchange is happening. Now we find ourselves in a Carl's bad pawn structure where maybe this b6 isn't super useful. Rook to c1 by white, putting pressure. Bishop to e6. Queen to a4. This is all normal moves. As you can see on the table base here, there's a lot of games that were played. Over 100 games where black played c5 here. One very notable game, Robert James against Boris Spassky. Our boy Fisher, okay, he gets hyped up a lot in chess and he definitely had some very memorable games. I think it was, was it the seventh game? I think it's the sixth, sixth, fifth, one of those games sixth in the world. Game. The sixth, sixth game. Oh, look at this guy remembering things. The sixth game of the world championship, he ended up, they played this variation and Fisher ended up winning. Which, okay, this is played 1973, a year after that match. So these people had seen the game. The game continues with c5, queen a3. Queen a3 is designed to pin the pawn to the e7 queen. Rook to c8. And now bishop b5. This is the okay, kind of the whole novel idea of white. In the old days before this game, they always played bishop e2. I think, oh yeah, I have it written here. Yeah. Oh yeah, six game. Yay. Six game of the world champion. But yeah, this variation there is was kind of new at the time. Bishop E2 was the main line. I was there's nothing wrong with it. It's still played today. Yeah, I didn't remember. I just was reading your notes. Uh yeah, I thought you were smart. I unfortunately lost my glasses, so I can hardly read my notes. But hey, Bishop B5. The idea is to invoke black into playing A6 and then say that the pawns are going to be weaker later on. Black, however, finds a very nice idea. He plays queen to b7. The idea with queen b7 is that he wants to push c5 and almost trap this bishop. He wants to punish white's idea. And I think this is almost the refutation of this whole idea of bishop b5. And I'm curious if this was thought of over the game. I think this was home preparation. So I think in my notes somewhere, yeah, I have written that this was played, yeah, this novelty was played against Geller, the guy playing black, like three years ago. And I'm sure he went and looked at that game and tried to find how to beat it. So he was well prepared. White is then forced to play d takes c5. He doesn't want his bishop getting trapped. After b takes c5, we see this hanging pawn structure. We've talked a bit about hanging pawns before. I think I end up doing a lot of these boring positional lectures and that. This is one of the exciting topics I've got, but I think there is some lecture I did on hanging pawns that should be on our YouTube channel if you want to check it out. Rook takes c5, rook takes c5, queen takes c5. 
And now the whole reason we're looking at this game. Let's move knight a6. Is actually an incredible move. And I think it shows the power of opening preparation. Because we hit the queen. So black, white has two options. Bishop takes a6 or queen to c6 defending the bishop and queen offering a queen trade. If queen c6 is played, you run into queen takes c6, bishop takes c6. And I think rook b8 hits the b2 pawn. If you play b3, then you go rook c8 and you have this idea. You're pinning the bishop to the potential skewer on c1. The whole idea of going rook b8 first is that if you go rook c8 first, he does this annoying bishop a4 and the bishop can block on d1 and white kind of gets away with murder and it's an interesting game still. But okay, this didn't happen in the game. Instead, we saw bishop takes a6, which makes a lot of sense, but now this diagonal is a problem. The queen takes a6, the king cannot castle. We're discussing obviously attacking the king in the center and we need to stop our opponent castling to do that. Now there's a lot of ideas happening of queen c rook c8 and there's a lot of potential. Black does have this isolated pawn, which could be a weakness, but he has dynamic compensation. Queen to a3 is played. White wants to trade queens. White wants to castle. The queen stays on the diagonal. Queen c4, keeping up the pressure. And now white decides that he cannot possibly dream of castling and plays king d2, which okay, we see annotated as a mistake on Lee Chess here. I think queen, yeah, queen c3 is the right move. The idea being, okay, if you trade, white is a, not the greatest pawn structure, but at least you can get his king safe. It's an interesting variation as well. But king d2 is a little overly ambitious. So again, now the king is in the center. It's going to be weak for a long time. And as well as the king being weak, the pawns that the king usually protects now become targets, which the player playing black tries to exploit as quickly as possible. Queen g4. He attacks the g2 pawn. How do you defend the g2 pawn? You can't play g3 because the knight's going to hang. So he has to play rook g1. He's already making a lot of ugly moves. Now, black plays super principally. He plays d4. Whenever you have this isolated pawn, which we've also talked about in previous lectures, you almost want to get rid of it at the right moment because it unleashes all your pieces. This bishop is now fantastic. There's going to be a file to the king. White does have two choices of how he wants to capture. He can capture with the knight or the pawn. I think if pawn takes... Okay, yeah, I do have a variation here. Just rook b8 and there's ideas of bishop d5 threatening to chop the knight and black becomes too active even though he is down two pawns. So knight takes is played in the game. Queen h4 targeting these weaknesses once again and white kind of has no way to defend these weaknesses. He chooses to play rookie two which gives up the f pawn in exchange for maybe solidifying the king slightly more. Black says thank you for the pawn. Rook to e2. The queen comes to f1, hovering around you again. This king is never going to feel safe, even though white is up just one pawn at the moment. So it doesn't, it's not even that much material. His king is going to be weak the whole game. Knight takes e6, f takes e6, queen d6. White tries to counter attack while blocking any ideas of the rook coming to d8. Now a move of class by black. It's not a flashy move. What would you play in this position of black? Any ideas? No ideas. Queen F6. You want to play queen f6. What's your idea of queen f6? What's your reason for playing it? I presume you're just wanting to protect this pawn and attack this pawn. Which, okay, I think... And twitch and rook, and twitch and rook d8. There's and three threats. Uh, three threats. Three threats. Three threats are cool. Two, no, two, two, two. Uh, uh, the third one was pet taking. <laughs> uh, we're going to take our own pawn, but yeah. um, This does look good. Like, I like this move. It feels like something I would probably play in a game. Maybe you can get away with king e8, yeah? Yeah, maybe king e is annoying. I mean, I'm not saying white is having the time of his life, yeah, but he's at least alive. 
the move played in the game is it kind of does the same thing as your move, but it's just King H8. And it's really nice to just take the time out from trying to murder your opponent and kind of just say, okay, you can move. And what is white supposed to move? The queen cannot leave this file. Otherwise, rook d8 is going to be game over. This rook is basically trapped here because he has to protect the king. So it's very hard for white to find a move. He just plays e4. And I think e4 is born out of not knowing what else to play more than actual desire to play the move. Black now plays rook c8. There's a, these pieces are coordinating on c1. The king steps up to e3. Get rook to f8. The king is continually being chased. Not entirely sure what's the idea behind rook f8. What is this? Hmm. Maybe I haven't analyzed this enough. Somebody find the threat. Is it just to... Maybe queen f4? Queen f4, though. There's a queen protecting it still. Which, okay, I don't... Even, even if we're not losing a piece, we don't want to trade queens. Maybe he's again just kind of taking it. Oh, no, sorry. Queen, 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 queen. queen where? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Queen c8. Queen c8. Yeah, queen c8. Sorry, queen c1. Sorry. Queen c1. Yeah, well, we're, we're all bad of numbers and letters. Yeah, queen c1 makes a lot of sense. And I think that is the idea. It does feel natural, which also makes sense why white plays rook d2, kind of blocking that idea before it happens. e5 by black. He just wants to open up everything. e5 kind of forces queen takes e5. Now if the queen e1, this rook is kind of under threat. So he has to block off the rook. Now queen g1. The king is continually harassed. This, I think, was calculated a little more than we're looking at here today. But we're mainly focusing on the ideas. The king comes to d3. We get rook d8 check. King c3. Queen d1. Just bringing all the pieces to the attack. The king has cut. The king has no shelter. He's not going to survive. Off the queen to b5, we get queen d4 check, king c2, and a6. Very nice move, a6. The idea being if the queen leaves this diagonal, the rook is going to drop to this fork. And if queen takes a6, as was played, queen c5, and thanks for coming. If you come here, you're probably just getting mated with rook b8. And if you go back, you're getting automated with rook to d1. So this was quite a nice game. And I I like watching Queen's Gambit games because they're often very tactical. I'm not the biggest fan of the show, but all these games are really interesting to look at. If we go back a bit and again recap. Probably the key moment is this preparation of knight a6, showing the value of actually preparing your openings properly. And then he just never lets his opponent castle. And the moment his opponent has stopped from castling, he keeps his foot on the throat, targeting these weaknesses. And he plays energetically and plays a very nice game. Okay, let's go on to another game. If there is no questions. This game is played by Mr. Arter Yusupov. He... <clears throat> My voice is leaving me. I beg your pardon. <clears throat> uh, and he's playing against Lanier Dominguez. Linnea Dominguez, obviously, he transferred in the last year or two. He transferred to the United States Chess Federation. So he was kind of in the news quite a bit. Not exactly sure which country he was originally playing for. I think it was some South American country. But this game, he's unfortunately on the losing side. Yusupov starts with d4. Black plays d5, c4, and c6. We get to see a Slav defense. e3, knight f6, knight c3 e6 knight f3 this is the main line i think we're going to enter a moron variation i think it's called that off the bishop d3 d takes c4 bishop takes c4 there's a lot of games here i think vichy Anand and some a lot of the russian players have some cool games in these lines b5 bishop d3 and bishop b7 Black is just wanting to play something like a6 and c5 and open up his bishop and then he's going to have quite a nice game White chooses to take the center with e4. We get pawn to b4, kicking away that knight. The knight is forced to come to a4. We saw some of these ideas in the Kasparov game we looked at, where Topolov was playing the perk, and there was always this pesky idea of b4. So he played a6 to stop it. 
Yeah, Yusupov didn't feel like he had time to do that. C5 is played. Black is breaking open very quickly and playing energetically. The pawn gets advanced to e5. The knight comes to d5. We get short castles. C takes d4. Now rookie one. I am going over this opening quite quickly because this is theory to a point. So I don't think the players are thinking too much. Linnea Dominguez especially is one of the best prepared players. I watched one of his games at the World Cup. Not this one, the previous one where I think he was in book till move like 36 or 40 or something. It was honestly ridiculous how much opening prep this guy has. But there is another line if you don't want to go rookie one and you want to take your pawn back rather. The knight takes d4. There's a sacrifice of the e5 pawn. I think I entered the variation here. I don't know why I have notes in German, but they are here. Bishop b5 check and there's this quite sharp line, which I think nowadays is considered fine for black. But there's lots of ideas if knight takes e6 and it can get very scary. I think a6 is the move that holds it all together and you force white to kind of do something. But in the game, rookie one is a lot safer approach. It's more solid. g6 is played. Black is viewing this pawn on e5 as a weakness. But it is intruding into black's half of the board and he doesn't like that very much. He wants to lay bishop g7, maybe queen to c7 and target it. Bishop g5. Whenever you move pawns, you create weaknesses. These dark squares are very weak. Now, we're going to see that play out as the game goes along. Queen to a5. Black brings his queen out. He puts pressure on this knight, kind of tying the white queen on d1 to its protection. Knight to d2. White tries to take advantage of these dark squares. He wants to bring the knight into e4 or c4. We get bishop to a6. Knight to c4 continuing of his plan. Black doesn't want to allow that, so he plays bishop takes c4 to buy himself some time. Bishop takes c4, and now bishop g7. Okay, let's take a time out here. Can we find a way to prevent Black from having a chance at castling? Some active plan. I'll give you guys some time to work out an answer. It is white to move. Any ideas? Because our pawn on e5 here is under a lot of pressure. Which I okay, gave. We give up that pawn, we're kind of losing our central control, which wouldn't be ideal. So we kind of also need to defend that. The move played in the game, which I'm not sure if too many of you calculated, is queen takes d4, which, okay, we understand this is hanging the knight on a4, but we need to see the justification for it. The justification is that he's playing bishop takes d5, and after e takes d5, he is not playing e6 and hanging his queen. He is playing queen takes d5. And now he is a piece down. We mentioned in our introduction that often... The side attacking the centralized king, he's willing to sacrifice pawns and sometimes even pieces to get at that king. And that is exactly what is happening now. Knight b6 is played. If black decides that he can castle, because his queen is still protecting this knight, then simply b3 chases the queen away and we're going to pick up the knight. So black needs to continue with something else, which he tries knight to b6, which 
This doesn't exactly work too well either, because after queen d6, suddenly there is no castling. The black king is stuck in the center. And a nice way of thinking about it, which I think Yusufov's notes mentioned, he's annotated this game, and he mentions that his thought process was that he was up on material in this position. Why is that? It's because he said this rook is useless. It's not going to get to play a part in the game, so practically he's up on exchange. That's how he thought about it. The queen came to d7, queen takes b4, staying on this diagonal. He's not letting black get out for free. Bishop to f8, attacking the queen, queen drops back to c3. Now the bishop is blocking him from castling. He chooses to play queen e6. You can see the annotation you mentioned, that's a fatal error. They want to go queen c8, which I think is better because it wins a tempo on the queen. Off the queen to e6, which is what was played, bishop to f6. And now there is never going to be any castling. And the dark squares are way too weak. Often this combination when you move your e-pawn and your g-pawn leads to very weak dark squares. So a lot of these openings where you fee and shadow your dark squared bishop, you often like to keep your e-pawn on its starting square. Rook g8 is basically forced. Now rook to d1. We see complete development by white. He has these two rooks, bishop, they're all contributing. Okay. So now black needs to find a way to develop. He's kind of stuck. He tries bishop e7. He needs to trade off this bishop. Otherwise, he's not going to have any safety. He's probably planning moves like rook d8, maybe even king f8 at some stage. You see Jeffro is drawing on the screen. I don't know how to disable that on Zoom. I need to actually work it out. But if you could, please contain yourself. Rook d6 is played, which, okay, this is kind of the killer move. And I think the beginning of the end. This e pawn, which is being blockaded by the queen, is the only thing keeping black alive at this stage. Black can never consider taking the rook on d6 because he's just going to get killed by our rook the moment the board opens up. He tries queen c8 now, but it's a bit too late. Rook to c6, queen to d8, and rook to c7. Which, okay, now there's pressure on this bishop, and it's very difficult for him to continue. I have some nice German notes here. It's pretty we don't have what to. Yeah, he can actually, he teaches German. So he would understand what that says, but I have no idea. Knight d5 is played, a very nice fork, but unfortunately white has a check, which, okay, taking advantage of the centralized king even more. So after king f8, we get another nice move, rook d7, queen e8, queen takes d5. And at this stage, we've pretty much got our material back. Yeah, we've got our material back, plus two extra pawns. Bishop takes f6 is played, which allows a final tactic of rook takes f7, with the idea being that if queen takes f7, the rook is going to hang. So, quite an interesting game, which I think Otto Yusupov showed what a quality player he is. He was probably in the top 10 of the world around the time this game was played. And it's a really nice game, because if we look from the point where he was able to cut off the king, Black tried to get slightly too greedy. This idea with g6 and targeting this pawn, it just takes slightly too long. And he plays really energetically to take advantage of it. He sacrifices the knight fearlessly. I think Black can try and castle here, which like, I think is a line that has been played by some weaker players, which ends in a draw. But this is Black's last chance to castle. He doesn't take it, and he ends up getting punished for it very nicely with just complete development. When you're playing against your opponent and he starts doing funny stuff, you just play normal chess. You don't need to try really hard to refute what he's doing. If you play principally, you are going to prevail in the end. Okay. Any questions about this game? We do have about 10 minutes left and then we'll call it a night. Um, hmm. What do we want to do? Do we want to do some more exercises? Any of these that are fun? Maybe some fun ones. That one's maybe fun. This one's fun. Maybe let, let's do one exercise or so, and then we will we'll have a look at one of my games quickly. We'll give you guys some comedy before we call it a night. I'm going to give you guys two minutes. This position is white to play, and then we'll discuss some ideas.
uh, Michael. Yes. I see. Uh, I see is... Rook E. Rook E one. Rook E one. What is your plan of Rook E one? Um, if the queen moves away. Okay, you're meaning Rook D one, right? Yes. Okay. If the queen goes, okay, I don't know. I'd say C six. I really want to say check. Okay. I mean, if you check, though, I just take. Then the queen on queen H. H4. Yes. H4, yeah. I um, mean, okay, I'm not sure I'm playing the best moves, but what if I just block? My queen is protecting you. I am attacking your rook. I'm not entirely sure what's happening. Yeah, and queen a1 is mate. Yeah, if I get the chance to play queen h1. For now, the queen is covering it though, so it's not quite relevant just yet, but it can play a part later on. Maybe I better off even trying to find a different move because I'd like to play rook g1 of mate, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure of this. I think I have this as a variation. What do I? Rook d1. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, my move's bad. For some, I'm, there's a reason queen c6 doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it does work. Stockfish, tell me the secrets. Apparently, Queen H4 is the most crushing thing ever because you protect your pawn and then you mate him. Maybe not the most crushing as the computer thinks about, but it's a nice idea. But the main problem with this Rook to D1 is this counter attacking me with Rook G5. Which, okay, basically, I'm attacking your queen. If we trade queens, black's going to have that advantage because the e7 pawn turns into a weakness. If you try to avoid trading queens, you have to play something like queen e2 to protect the rook still. Then I can continue counterattacking with rook g2. And we might have the weirdest perpetual, but either way, I don't think you're winning. Nice idea though. Rook d1 is definitely something that needs to be calculated. Any other ideas? I was busy trying to calculate um, e6. Mm, e6 looks very interesting. I mean, okay, the first um, thing we need to note is, okay, we are hanging our queen, but we're going to get to take on f Not really. Yeah. If you take uh, you take on f7 and you get your queen back, thank you, you very much. You get your queen back. And also these pieces are kind of sidelined, so I'm pretty sure there's a checkmate coming. So that this does... My, my biggest concern was queen takes the like because like, obviously rook takes you go queen f7 um okay. queen f7 Where, yeah and that is just kind of mate so queen takes as you mentioned is a big consideration there's one other move we'll look at you're um, on the right track this is the way i got stuck i'm not sure what yeah because if we're not move. careful we're just dropping this so mm. there is a Nice move, yeah. It's just queen a5. So again, nice ah. geometry. Which, okay, now we thread in these ideas. If he goes and picks up e7, we can play queen a8. And there's all these ideas of rook check. I think they just play queen a4 and pick up this pawn. And this position with the weaker black king and being up a pawn is quite good for white. So that is one of the variations. The other variation, which I don't think you considered, and I didn't consider either when I first looked at this, Rook f6, which is a surprisingly interesting move. Because, okay, we are on kind of reverse hanging our queen here, but we're really not because there's going to be back rank checkmates. If you simply play rook takes f6, you have to worry about queen takes h5. And the queen on h5 protects f7. So it's an interesting move. I think the, refu the refutation is just e takes f7, which... Okay, it's a variation of the rook takes f7. There's this very cool move, queen g6, just planning to come in here. And off the queen e6, we come into g8, he takes the pawn, we play rook d1. And again, there's this geometry where the black king has no shelter. He's forced to just sit passively and hope for the best, really. But yeah, your instincts were right with the e6 move. Okay. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't really think we have time to go through 
our last game. Is there one more puzzle? Yeah, that's worth our time. Uh, these are terrible. Maybe one of these that's interesting. Hmm, how much faith do I have in you people? Let's do this one. As our last puzzle for the evening, then we'll call it a night and we can all go sleep or something. So this is white to move. I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes and then we'll discuss it. I'm just curious how black got his bishops. He should not have three bishops. I can tell you that much. Um, is this like bug house chess? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be a pawn. Can I fix this quickly? If I go to editor, ha, I can. Yeah, this is very much a pawn. I don't know how I missed that. Okay, no one saw anything though, so everything's fine. Just edit that out of the recording and I'll look smart. Okay, still white to play though. <laughs> Okay. Anyone have any variations I'd like to share? Um, I had a variation, but I'm calculating a different one now. I think I, I think I may have solved it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are you calculating? Um, well, I initially calculated one of the knights to go to f4. Okay. Uh, f5, I mean. Uh, but now I'm looking at queen h6 check. Mm. And then after king takes, then knight f4, bishop takes f4, knight takes f4, king h5, uh, rook h3, king g4, then maybe rook f to f3. No, no, that's not gonna work. Um, okay, that is. Oh, no, 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 rook, rook h, no, no, the knight's defending them. Uh, <laughs> You know you're so close, but you're just not visualizing it fully. I think bishop e2 is just mate there, isn't it? No, no, because the knight hanging, isn't it? Oh, the knight's oh, hanging. Yeah, cool. yeah, I'm not visualizing it properly. What is it? I had the variation written down in my other line, but yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter because he just takes it. Uh, look there, then. Yeah, king g4, we can just mate here. Yeah. No, that's not mate. It's Is it here and then bishop e2? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so there we go. Yeah, it's, it's a, you got to combine both ideas, which, okay, this is a nice... Oh, name. so close. So, so close. close, but yet so far, right? Um, but if you try, I think, Knight Geo, I think the defense is just to play King... Yes, so that's what I was calculating, and then, like, Queen H6, then just King uh, E1, and just E8, kind of, and then it's like, Rook E1, and then it's like, oh, he's getting out. Yeah, I think what... Almost works. Is it that's what rookie? stumbled me onto Queen H6 first? Yeah. You can also think rookie one year, which is an interesting move again, but there's always moves like bishop e6 to yeah. ensure yes, his mistake. The file. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I think that is the end of our time together. It I hope people found the lesson informative. I will be sharing this leeches study with everyone, which there's a bunch of exercises here you can work through. I will see if I remember to share the answers. Otherwise, you're welcome to message me on WhatsApp if I forget. 
Um, I think that's about everything. We will have next week, I think, Andrew Talmarcus is doing a lecture, so that should be interesting as well. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for the lesson, Michael. Michael. Thanks, buddy. Yes, the Michael. I just want to say it's good to know that uh, Fisher is your boy. Yeah, <laughs> my boy Fisher. He's... <laughs> no, Fisher has. Fisher's an interesting player. You should. There's always that game. I think when he was really young, where he sacrificed his queen for two pieces. I think if you search like yeah. Fisher Queen Sacrifice, you'll find a really nice game. But yeah. Oh, okay. I will look. I will search for it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna end it there. Okay. Have a good Thank evening, you. everyone. Thanks, right. Michael. Bye. Bye. Bye.